Tokyo, Japan, is a place where you can't be sure that the building you leaned your bicycle against yesterday will be there tomorrow. And since the war, the bomb, the defeat and the boom, there's been the same high casualty rate among religions, which have sprung up new, fulfilled a need and faded. So it seemed sense, even with traffic in a jam, the air heavy with diesel fumes and urban claustrophobia moving gently up the windpipe, to look at a religion that, so far at least, has lasted. There have been Buddhists on these islands for one and a half thousand years, and this search is for Japanese Buddhism. The Buddha I thought I knew already was the Buddha I'd heard of in Sri Lanka, what we used to call Ceylon. His teaching had been carried south from India by a Buddhist prince and six Buddhist monks who'd landed here 2,000 years ago and converted the king. After that, Buddhism rolled in without obstruction. The Buddha, as remembered in Sri Lanka, is a man. The most extraordinary man, but a man. Questions like, who created the world? Does Almighty God exist? If so, does he love me? The Buddha doesn't even ask himself. Nor, he said, should we. He taught a way, the way to Nirvana. And when he taught, he died. But Japan is right at the other end of the Buddhist world. The monks who carried the teaching there went north out of India. They took the silk route, through the snows, over the mountains. And so across China, meeting new hazards, new civilizations and new gods, and into Japan. I ask myself this question. If the Buddha of Japan met the Buddha of Sri Lanka after all this time, would they recognize each other? The search began in a Tokyo restaurant, five floors high and busy. Its nickname, regardless of what the billboard says, is the Zen restaurant, and that's what intrigued me. Say Buddhism and Japan in one breath, and people like me say Zen. The restaurant is owned by Mr. Tani, once a barrow boy, but now in his 80s and a successful businessman. 45 years ago, during the Depression, starving and jobless, Mr. Tani could see no way out but to kill himself. Instead, so he says, he sat quite still and attempted to switch off the bombardment of his thoughts by listening to his breath. He stayed alive. Since then, while business has boomed, he has been a practitioner of Zazen, sitting meditation. What's more, everyone who works for him sits too, all 400 of them, once a month with weekend refresher courses. Otherwise, he doesn't employ them. The word Zen I've heard described as a Japanese mispronunciation of a Chinese mispronunciation of a Sanskrit word which means something like meditation. But where's the Buddha? There's no image, no chanting, no scripture, no sermon, nothing a Westerner can nod to and say, ah yes, religion. Just waitresses, cashiers, cooks and the doorman under Mr. Tani's eye, sitting still, being where they are, and breathing. It's a mute affront to everything most of us think of when we say the word religion. But they call it Buddhism, all right? Zen Buddhism. And that's Zen too. To the Japanese, Zen isn't the last word in Japanese Buddhism. It's just one of 13 traditional Buddhist schools and not even the most popular. P. 
people asked me, looking puzzled, why the West was so captivated. After the session, I had a word with the girl who got slapped. What's the point of it? I asked her. That's to encourage me. To encourage? Not wake you up? That too, she said, but I'd be quite wrong to see the man with the stick as an enemy or a critic. I asked how people outside reacted when they heard she was doing Zazen. At first, she said, they thought it a bit eccentric because they didn't know anything about it. But now they can see a change in her. She's gentler. Her friends say that her face, her expression, has softened. The question, how did Zen start? may produce, as it did for me here, the story of the venerable Kashapa. One day, near the end of his life, so the story goes, Gautama the Buddha was asked to preach a sermon. He stood before his audience, but instead of opening his mouth, he held up a flower. Everybody present, with one exception, waited for words of explanation. One man, his disciple Kashapa, smiled. At which the Buddha said, There is a supreme Dharma, a wonderful truth. Words cannot reach it, and words cannot teach it. That truth I have just handed to Kashyapa. And that, said the storyteller, is how the Zen truth will always be handed on, from master to pupil, in a special transmission, outside all ritual, outside all scripture. The first Zen master I met lives with his wife in a suburb of Tokyo and runs a training school in sword fighting and calligraphy, writing with a brush. His name is Master Omori. You'd call him, I think, a traditionalist. He described what he was drawing as the pinnacle of Zen. Ah, good, I thought. He's writing an explanation. The words mean great empty circle. Omori-san is a master of sword fighting as well. Zen is sometimes called the warrior's way. I watched him take an exercise with a pupil, what he described as a sword fighter's grammar that starts with a bow to a shrine. Next, he said, your hands salute the source of your energy. Not your thinking, weaving, scheming old head, but a place in your middle, your empty circle.
To each fighter, the other is not his enemy, but his shadow, his reflection. The moment you feel enmity or fear of death, he said, you're defeated. That, said the master, tells me whether the pupil can put the whole of himself into one simple, undeflected blow. When they bowed to each other, they bowed to an image. Is that the Buddha? I asked. A form of Buddha, came the answer. A Bodhisattva. When I bow to it, I bow to something in my own heart. That's something I call compassion. is the Buddha. Who is the Buddha? Uh, no de dario Buddha. Hmm? Buddha or dario. Roshi no kangare. He is. You are the Buddha. Yeah. Mina Buddha. Buddha. Everyone is. Everything is. Could you show me that again? Yeah. This is the Buddha? Yeah. Explain some more, yeah. please. Just to such a mystical thing. All are Buddha. What we call Buddha, he said, is not something outside which we worship. Our very basis is Buddha. Ourselves, heaven, earth, trees, birds, dogs, all are Buddha. This is the way of thinking in Buddhism as I understand it. Zazen, sitting meditation, leads you to make the discovery. The Buddha is not over there, but here. This is Buddha realization, waking up to our Buddha nature. The Buddha is not something outside of you to be worshipped. It is uh, your basic self. And uh, that is the principle of Buddhism, that everything is one. That, I suddenly thought, is why this man, over 70, has such a straight back. He relies on himself. But what about all the bent backs of Europe, or Japan for that matter? Where do they lean? 
Is there a Buddha for leaners? For those who need to rely on a power bigger than they are? The bullet train takes you from Tokyo to Kyoto, over 300 miles in under three hours. And there's Mount Fuji. So on to Kyoto with a side thought from a train window. It's all very well for Master Omori to say, I am the Buddha, you are the Buddha. The people down there in those houses are Buddha. But one form of Buddha, at least, we are not. We are not the great teacher, 2,000 years dead, who's known as the founder of Buddhism. We're not in Nirvana. I'm in a train. Kyoto, the old capital of Japan, set among the hills. On one estimate, there are in Kyoto 3,000 Buddhist temples and 1,500 Shinto shrines. Shinto means literally the way of the gods, in contrast to the way of the Buddha. It's the special nature and spirit worship of Japan. This is one of the biggest Shinto shrines in Kyoto. Worshippers make an offering, ring a bell, and clap their hands to draw the attention of the local spirit, or kami, their way. The spirit presence seems in some way to inhabit a sacred mirror. Then, as likely as not, the worshipper goes to a Buddhist priest in the same compound to have his fortune told. Over 1,000 years of religious harmony, which is what Buddhism and Shinto share, means that a man can have a Shinto wedding and a Buddhist funeral without changing sides. It's amazing, without a pope, a Quran, or a jealous god looking down on it, that Buddhism hasn't compromised itself out of existence. At least one powerful Buddhist group in Japan would say that it has. They go by the name Soka Gakkai, Society for the Creation of Values, and their head temple rests by Mount Fuji, like the Ark on Mount Ararat. It's a building that speaks buoyancy, wealth, security, energy, hygiene, modernity, mighty capacity. Critics say it isn't even Buddhist. Soka Gakkai says it's not just Buddhist, it's Buddhism of the only true sort. Most of these people are paying their annual visit to the shrine which houses the sacred emblem of the new age of Buddhism. Soka Gakkai claims the right scripture, right worship, right Buddha. No longer Gautama, but a Buddha for these more strenuous days. It's here that I felt furthest from Sri Lanka where, if Gautama the Buddha said anything, he said that life is impermanent, uncertain, and changeable. So, accept it, see through it, and then, leaning on no one, follow the Noble Eightfold Path, alone. Gautama, says Soka Gakkai, doesn't speak to the age we live in. This vast temple in Kyoto belongs to one of the Pure Land sects. I came here because of a Zen monk who called Pure Land the bravest and best religious movement in Japanese history. At a time when Buddhism was for monks, scholars, professionals, the Pure Land teaching gave hope to the masses. And for 800 years, the masses have kept it going. They call Pure Land Buddhism the easy way. I asked for, and got, a child's guide to the teaching. It went like this. Somewhere there is a pure land where we shall all one day be reborn. The pure land is the land of Amida Buddha, 
Lord of Light and Life, who promises that we shall all one day join him there. Our gratitude to Amida is expressed in the invocation, I rely on Amida Buddha. This invocation, simple as it seems, is the Buddha's raft, which will take us through to the Pure Land, for we surely cannot swim there ourselves. Rather as you'd expect at court, there's a Pure Land dynasty in this temple, claiming descent from the founder of the sect 800 years ago. I paid my respects to the current patriarch, who also happens to be a relative of the emperor. He received me in an imperial audience chamber, a Japanese national treasure. It felt odd to be sitting talking about Buddhism for the roughnecks, the helpless, the hopeless, the penniless, in a room which spoke to me of centuries of privilege and the flowering in pictures of a whole refined aristocratic civilization. talk itself was very practical. In effect, he warned me against being too literal, too Western, too concrete. The truth you can put into words and pictures, he said, is never the absolute truth. When I said the easy way sounded too easy for words, he said, not when you try it. Afterwards, the interpreter, Mr. Kumata, took me across the road for a cup of coffee. He's a pure land priest. Uh, would you say that the center, the religious center for the people we saw in the temple, is the temple? Or is it the home or somewhere else? Well, I suppose uh, you could say that the temple is the center. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a saying which says, uh, uh, during the day you should worship at your family altar in the mornings and evenings. But once a week, at least you should go to the temple. That's the focus. Yes. If you wanted to take me to where you thought I would see some pure land in action, then would it be a family or where would you Yes, suggest? I would take you to a family. Along this street, in an off-centre section of Tokyo, there's a family shoe shop. It belongs to a pure land grandmother, Mrs. Imamura, one of the 20 million Pure Land believers. The idea behind the bowing seems to be that the one who stops first accepts the one-up position, which nobody publicly wants to do. On the wall at the back was a reproduction of a French Impressionist painting. Beyond and upstairs were the living quarters for the whole of her family. Hey. Son minded the shop, daughter-in-law was at the sink, Grandchildren were at the television watching sumo wrestling, well described as the survival of the fattest.
On the hearth, among pure lamp scrolls and statuary, the most startling object was a pottery group of a mother pulling a child's trousers up. That, oddly, was the clue to our conversation. Is Pure Land Buddhism to do with the home? Is the warmth of the home something to do with the Pure Land? Yes. The Pure Land, she said, is the mother that loves her child. The Pure Land, to me, is the sun that brings warmth to the heart. But Amida's love is warmer than the sun and bigger than the love of any mother, of any grandmother even. The very warmth of the home is a portion of the Pure Land. How does Mrs. Imamura uh, look upon people who are not Pure Land Buddhists and therefore may not be delivered into the Pure Land? To me, there is no differentiation between the devotee of the Pure Land and the followers of other religions. Eventually, I believe that all of the people will be delivered into the Pure Land through the Amida Buddha's uh, compassion. It's a bit of an irony to go in search of the Pure Land in the acrid and poisonous air of an industrial suburb, but that's where we went next. Mr. Kumata took me to the Sugita Wire Works in Tokyo. The Sugitas have a dynasty too, and this is the current patriarch. He comes over as tough, poised, self-reliant, a natural industrial fighter. It's hard to think of him saying, I rely on anything outside himself, even Amida Buddha, but he's a devoted Pure Land believer. Why, I said, as we went round the works, don't you go in for Zen? I should think self-reliance would appeal to you. Zen takes time, he said. I've got my hands full here. Once a month, workers, neighbors, anyone who wants to, joins Mr. Sugita in the room next to his office for a Pure Land service. By the way, the chants, the sermon, the minister in the black gown are evidently meant to look Protestant. I was told how last century Protestant missions had made some gains and the Buddhists picked up the style. But the likeness ends there. These are not prayers to a god for what he may do next, but thanks to the Buddha for what he's done already which, in Mr. Sugita's words, is to fill the world with limbs of his compassion, drawing us all up towards him. He's talking about a great northern Buddhist theme. You hear it time after time, the idea of the Bodhisattva. The Buddha, the Bodhisattva. The question, what's the connection, gets various answers. Here's the one I heard most often. Let's say, just for now, that a Buddha is a being who has passed quite beyond the reach of time, history, rebirth and suffering. It's even wrong to think of him as a being at all. The Bodhisattva is one standing poised for Buddhahood who, instead of going forward, reaches back so that he can take the rest of us, animals and all, along with him. Buddhists can no more sculpt the compassion of the Buddha than Christians can sculpt the love of God, but they try.
placid faces, slender frames and infinite helping hands for countless helpless creatures, animals, insects, men, microbes. It's the idea of the great savior. I kept being drawn back to this gallery, which houses a thousand and one forms of the Bodhisattva of Compassion. It's the place I'd choose in all Kyoto if I wanted to muse on the idea of the Bodhisattva. thought. Jesus, in the eyes of Christians, is one saviour, one God. I wonder if a Japanese Buddhist reading the Christian Gospels might see him as one saviour among many, as a great Bodhisattva. Halfway through this particular search, I might have spoken of two forms of Buddhism pointing opposite ways. Zen pointing to self-reliance and Pure Land pointing to self-abandonment. I even found two Japanese words to cover them. One meaning self-help and the other meaning help of another. But now I'm not so sure. What the two sides share seems of more consequence than where they differ. They are each mounting an assault, they tell you, on blind ego on what they call a deluded belief that we are permanent, separate, self-sufficient entities. The styles, of course, vary. You don't have to be told that a young man wielding a stick is very different from an old woman singing a hymn. But they are not rivals. They share one destination. All I can say is that Pure Land gave me new eyes for Zen. Zen, said the archery master, is easy. The target is myself. I reach the point of no effort. The arrow leaves the bow. Buddhism, they say, is like a thorn you use to remove another thorn, the thorn of self. When the thorn of self is out, there's no more use for Buddhism. Throw it away. Tea with two Zen tea masters. The story goes that tea was brought from China to Japan by Zen monks who found it kept them fresh. How different, I thought, from the tea bag ceremony, as it is widely known in the West. That is, a bag flung in a cup, casually submerged in boiling water, and left to stew. The purpose of the meeting is to be all there, not passing through on the way somewhere else. The water boils. The sound changes. He whisks the tea.
Before you study Zen, said the tea master, a bowl is a bowl and tea is tea. While you're studying Zen, a bowl is no longer a bowl and tea is no longer tea. When you're enlightened, a bowl is again a bowl and tea is tea. They're admiring the tea bowl. Japan is often called the land of the rising sun. After this trip, I may have to call it the land of the disappearing Buddha. The single question, who is the Buddha, produces answers as various as you, me, this stick, nothing, a dead teacher, truth, the thingness of a thing, an empty circle, compassion, or a shake of the head. Until you start to wonder if maybe you've asked something silly. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a Zen creed, or a Zen prayer, or a Zen image that you could point to and say, believe that, recite that, adore that, and you'll suddenly know what Zen is all about. But there isn't. There simply isn't. Not only that, I sometimes get the feeling that Zen is mounting an endless protest, a mute sit-in, against any attempt to reduce complex things to a simple formula that says, that's how it is. Oi. When it certainly isn't. This is Daitokuji, a Zen monastery, and I've come to see the abbot. One way and there's room after room with mats, screens, no furniture. Look the other way and there's always a garden. The abbot is Master Kobori. I had a feeling that I should walk extremely quietly. This was a natural feeling. Um, is this a deliberate intention on your part to keep sound very low. Well, yes. One of the characteristic of the mind is quietude. Therefore, even unconsciously, we walk very quietly. In the houses of many men who belong to religions, one sees images. In this building, I see a circle and various other forms which are not of a person. Has the Buddha disappeared in this house? Well, uh, there is a Buddha for those who do not know what he is, really. There is no Buddha for those who know what he is, really. There is Buddha for those who do not know what he is, really. There is no Buddha for those who know what he is, really. What is the most important single thing that a man should do in his life? To know himself. 
not only through idea, but with through his total being. I believe it. And out of all the Zen activities I've looked at, archery, calligraphy, sword fighting, Zazen meditation, which is the one a man should start with? I can say Zazen, sitting meditation. But the sitting meditation looks so stiff and deliberate. Yes, in the beginning it is conscious, deliberate, formal. Everything is so in the beginning. It cannot be natural from the beginning. <laughs> uh, it looks uh, physically, certainly for most Westerners, extremely difficult to get your knees onto the ground, to have your ears and nose and belly in the right order. Uh, why is it so important to be exact about those things? Well, that is the physically most uh, balanced state. Physically. Just like stone placed on, on the ground. If stone is round, this will be moved by wind. But if it is exactly square, you know, then it cannot be moved easily. Now a stone or a frog sits naturally, without effort. I wonder if that's the clue I'm looking for. On a windy day, I went to a Zen training monastery in Kobe to find out. When I was there, the novices were sitting five hours a day with short breaks. But sittings can last sometimes 18 hours, sometimes longer. No one here takes religious vows. He stays till he or the master decides he should go. It's not unusual for employers in industry to send new recruits for a period of Zen training to toughen them up. The day starts early, ends late, and has no slack in it. In the meditation hall, they give a misleading impression of solemnity. But they're not so solemn to talk to. And the biggest laugh I heard was when I said to one of them, can you describe what it's like to be enlightened? The novice master compared the slap on the shoulder with the slap on the backside of a newborn child. Both may need it to come to life. But isn't it entirely selfish, this concentration on your own state of mind, your own enlightenment? I took the problem to the abbot, Master Yamada Mumon, head of two monasteries. The man who is in print is saying that Zen in Japan is dead and ought to be re-imported from America. <laughs> he held a stick and I had an alert feeling that at any moment he might hit me. What's the connection, I asked, between Zazen, sitting meditation, and having compassion for other creatures? Zazen uh, Sitting in Zazen, he said, I become nothing and everything becomes nothing. That is to say, I and everything melt into one. So when I see a flower, the flower is I. When I see the moon, the moon is I. All things become I. There is no greater love than this. Can Zen, I asked, ever be popular or must it always be something for the elite? His answer propelled me out of the Japanese tradition and into the one I was born in. He quoted Jesus. Unless the heart becomes that of a little child, a man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Zazen is becoming a little child.
If he had to say one thing about Zen, I asked, would it be that? The baby, he replied, has no knowledge and no experience. It is a zero. Yes. But zero, to me, means emptiness, vacancy. Could he explain, I asked him, how a zero can be something so desirable? So he took a stick and he balanced it on his finger. The past, he said, pointing to one side, won't come back. And the future, pointing to the other, has yet to happen. And here, pointing to the pivot, is the present. No extent, no substance, no permanence. Yet, if abundance is anywhere, here's where it has to be, in the empty moment, because that's all we've got. The day ended with an event literally beyond description. Seen from the outside, a meeting took place, as it does every day, between the novices and the abbot. It centres on the koan, a puzzle set by the master, a device to stop the mind in its tracks. It might be, what is the sound of one hand clapping? What was your original face before you were born? Does a dog have Buddha nature? And there are supposedly 1,700 more. I suppose in his place, my koan would be, where is the Buddha? The answer, what anyone does or says, is something transmitted between novice and abbot, and them only. The novice repeated his koan. Does a dog have Buddha nature? <laughs> His words were, you must put your strength in your abdomen, your middle, enter the state where there is no I and no world, and speak from emptiness. A word with the lips alone is no good. <laughs> 